Hey, hi, hello everyone. My name is Lydia. Welcome to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you are interested in true crime, like I am, I hope you stick around. A special hello and thank you to my returning subscribers. I am so happy to have you here. Thank you for indulging me as I posted a few horror reading videos around the time of Halloween. I really enjoyed myself and if you haven't checked them out, I hope you do. They are listed under my playlist of horror readings on my channel. I have a couple pieces of um, Edgar Allan Poe's that I did a reading for and I also did a reading for an original creepypasta story. So. If you want to check it out, please do. But for now, we are back to true crime. And this case was recommended by a viewer named Charlotte, and her partner actually was from the area where this story occurred and happened, and he was also interviewed around the time of the case as well. This is the case of double murderer and one of Britain's most notorious killers, Stephen Farrow. This sad story begins in the beautiful English countryside in the mid-1960s with the birth of a child that was dealt a bad hand from the very beginning of his life. And he was absolutely intent on using that bad hand to punish as much and as many as he could. Stephen Farrah was considered the black sheep of his family almost from the very moment of his birth in 1964. He was the youngest of Reg and Doreen's six children and was absolutely unwanted in his unplanned conception and subsequent birth. And Stephen's father made sure that he knew, that Stephen knew, how much he had been unwanted. Stephen's father, Reg Farrer, was described as violent and aggressive, and he outright favored his other children over Stephen. He made it perfectly clear. In an act of outright abusive and dysfunctional parenting, Stephen's father admittedly turned all of Stephen's siblings against him. And in return of this abusive upbringing, Stephen hated his father with a ferociousness. He was almost single-minded with an anger that boiled and festered within him. And it is highly likely that Stephen's resulting behavior was a result of his horrible upbringing. But Stephen's mom, his only champion, had paid close attention to him and had had other thoughts. Maybe he was born with, quote, something wrong with him, unquote, she would repeatedly say. Whatever the case, close family members would report that Stephen never slept properly as a child and reported that Stephen's mother had said that she would have rather had her first five children all over again than have another one like Stephen because he was so difficult to cope with as a child. I mean, it seems to me that she can blame her husband, Reg, for that. In spite of these parental difficulties, Stephen's mother still harbored a soft spot for Stephen, even though he was angry all the time. She thought of Stephen as her favorite child and doted on him accordingly, secretly hoping that maybe love would bring Stephen around. But as it turns out, all the love in the world could not control Stephen Farrow's behavior. On his first day of school, his very first day, Stephen was sent home for being, quote, hyperactive and having general misbehavior. Throughout his childhood, Stephen, quote, admitted to punching total strangers on buses and trains because he couldn't punch his father. At the age of 10, Stephen showed a keen interest in setting rags on fire and then putting those fiery rags in old ladies' letterboxes. And we, as true crime enthusiasts, already know what that means. Having an interest in setting fires at a young age, already with an abusive and dysfunctional background, this is a major red flag, for sure. And this desire to commit arson didn't stop there. Stephen moved on to the church itself as he was bent on wreaking destruction. Luckily, the fire that Stephen set inside the church was contained to the altar area, 
but that act of arson was a major turning point in his life. It was his first physical act of his hatred of all things religious. And where did all this hate come from? Stephen's extended family cited that Reg Farrow, Stephen's father, as also being anti-Christianity and thought that Stephen was directing his anger towards the church in an attempt to win favor with his father. Others cited that Stephen's own outcry of sexual assault and ongoing abuse by a priest as the true reason Stephen hated all things religious. Oh, and if you thought that Stephen's list of misdeeds and misdoings was complete, you would be wrong. Along with setting fire to churches and to rags and putting them in old ladies' mailboxes, I bet you can guess what he also liked to do. Stephen had a sadistic nature that was obvious very early on, as he reportedly liked to hurt and kill small animals. Which, as it always seems to do, seemed to be a dress rehearsal for the major things and the major acts that he would complete later on in his teenage years. So as Stephen moved on into his teens, he wasted no time in taking his criminal conduct to the next level. His first conviction was in 1979 at the age of 15 for burglary and he was placed on probation for arson just three years later in 1982. He was handed a partially suspended sentence for theft and deception in 1988 and a 12-month prison term just a year later in 1989. And that time, the prison term was for burglary. Stephen Farrow's rap sheet was getting longer and longer with each passing year. And in 1993, Stephen was finally jailed for a four-year length prison sentence for burglary, theft, and deception. That was only the beginning of his crimes to come. He had the absolute worst crimes to come next. It was during that four-year jail sentence in the year 1994 that Stephen was permitted to be out of the jail on leave. Sure, just take a break from jail, why not? And when he was home on leave, he took the chance to attack 77-year-old Sheila Crow with a knife in her home. Yes, while he was on break from prison, Stephen had followed his former landlady home and then had barged into her house. He threatened to kill all her dogs. And then, ultimately, he attacked her when she lunged for his knife, trying to get it away from him. A 77-year-old woman. Really, Stephen? As a result from that attack, Sheila suffered two black eyes, slashed hands, and a missing tooth. She had been beaten pretty badly. And why not? While he was there attacking this 77-year-old former landlady, Stephen decided to rob her as well. Ultimately, all he was able to escape with was a jar of coins, worth about 26 pounds or about $29. He just couldn't help himself. So, from this incident, the crime that he committed while he was on home leave from the jail, Stephen admitted to burglary and assault, and he was jailed for eight years this time, and that term began in October 1995. And before Stephen's trial for that crime had ended, he had admitted this. He had acknowledged, quote, that he did have a dark side, and he wanted to get treatment. Stephen knew that there was something not right in his mind, and he did realize that, and he wanted to get help. So, I mean, being in prison for eight years, why not get the help while you're there, right? And that was what Stephen Farrow thought. So while he was safely tucked away in prison, thankfully, and not allowed to be on home leave again, he finally did receive some mental health services. And those mental health services came in the form of evaluations, diagnoses, and treatment. And this was probably for the very first time in his life. But in any case, Stephen was finally assessed by a forensic psychiatrist 
And the results were, of course, alarming. Stephen had stated to the psychiatrist that he had wanted to kill someone all the way back from the age of 13 or 14. And he claimed to have assaulted a disabled boy and a boy of around only eight years old when Stephen was still in his teens. He also claimed that he had killed a backpacker when he was 25 years old. And Stephen went on to tell the jail psychiatrist more disturbing things. He said that he had developed violent sexual fantasies, which involved raping young girls and breaking into the homes of old women, tying up their husband and raping the woman in front of him, then killing the husband in front of the woman, and then killing the woman by hanging, suffocation, or stabbing. This seems like a pretty pinned down plot to me. These seemed like real plans, real thoughts, real dangerous. And you have to give it to Stephen Farrow for admitting these dark thoughts to a psychiatrist. He was being truthful. He was telling someone what he had been thinking about and what he would do if he could. What he would do if he was allowed to leave the jail. What he might do. And with those truly shocking statements, Stephen was declared officially to have a psychopathic disorder, an antisocial personality disorder, and labeled as a potential extremely dangerous individual. The psychiatrist went on to say, quote, if Stephen's account of his fantasies was to be believed, it may not be long before Stephen committed serious offenses. Again. So, even with those feelings and thoughts voiced out loud, even with it heard by a psychiatrist and written down somewhere in his file, even with that, he had served his time. And Stephen Farrow was released, released from prison in the year 2000. And with no containment plan from the very mental health professionals that had issued that dire warning to the prison system and whom had surely known that Stephen Farrow was a very, very dangerous man. That was the year 2000. Let's fast forward to the year 2012. In those 12 years, up until the time in 2012, Stephen had jumped around from job to job, repeatedly switching employers very often and smoking marijuana even more often. And it is assumed with his psychopathic tendencies that during that time, he was still committing some crimes. Oh yes, he was still active in the criminal world for sure but there seemed to be very little that could be credited to him, you know, pinned on him, until Christmas of 2011 and New Year's of 2012. Around New Year's of 2012, it seemed that Stephen Farrow had stepped fully back into the world of crime. And this time, by this time, 12 years after he had been released from prison, he didn't seem to care about being caught. Stephen had let those dark corners of his mind, those dark corners that he knew about, fully creep in and had taken over. He seemed to be led by his obsessive hate of all things religious, and he was fueled by the same anger as he broke into a house. This time, during this burglary in early 2012, luckily, no one had been home. And Stephen happened to think that was lucky for the homeowner as well, because he left a note. He had left a message scribbled in red ink and pinned to the kitchen table with two knives for the occupants of that home. The note read, quote, Be thankful you did not come back, or we would have killed you, Christian scum. I hate God, unquote. Uh, yes, coming home to my house with that note uh, pinned to my table with two knives, I would have certainly taken that very seriously. Now, during this time period in New Year's 2012, Stephen Farrow still had friends, albeit they were criminal friends, and he had texted a friend during this time saying, quote, 
the church will be the first to suffer. It seems Stephen had plans, concrete plans. And during this time frame, it was reported that Stephen Farrer had traveled to the Canterbury, England area with the intention of killing Archbishop Rowan Williams, but he had been put off of it by the level of security around the Archbishop. And because of this, Stephen decided to change his plans. And on January 4th, 2012, he broke into the lovely seaside cottage home of Betty Yates. And if it seemed as if the lovely older Betty Yates was a consolation prize until Stephen could substitute his desire for murdering a high-ranking religious official, you would be right. And when Betty Yates's body was discovered, a gruesome scene unfolded to a horrendous act, a murderous act, but one that was so full of rage and violence that it seemed as if Stephen Farrow had truly enjoyed the act of murder. Betty had been beaten with her walking stick before her murder, which was proven with a resulting massive wound to her head and a splintered and destroyed walking stick. Additionally, the multiple stab wounds that Betty Yates suffered seemed to convey to the investigators that Stephen had stabbed Betty almost for pleasure, and then he had just left the knife sticking out of her neck. Truly horrible. As Betty's murder investigation continued, the local Crime Stoppers offered a reward of 10,000 pounds, or 11,000 American US dollars, for information on the murder. And new leads were investigated after the crime was featured on BBC One's Crime Watch. And had Stephen just had been caught in time, he could have been stopped from committing the final act of his dark and twisted grand plan. But he was not stopped. On February 14th, 2012, the Reverend John Suttard's body was found by builders in his home. The Reverend John was reported to have been a, quote, former lawyer who joined the clergy after a car accident had only moved to his new parish in June 2011 from Essex. He had previously spoken of the risks of his occupation in which he would regularly welcome strangers into his home. And yes, that is true. Typically a reverend, a priest, a pastor, some sort of religious leader will typically welcome someone into their home if they look like they need help, of course. And Reverend John Suttard's realization of that fact proved right on Valentine's Day of all days. It was that day that the Reverend allowed the last stranger, the very last stranger he ever would, into his home. And that stranger was, of course, Stephen Farrow. Stephen later said that he had met the Reverend by chance and that this chance encounter provided him with finally getting the opportunity that he had always wanted. He was finally getting his long-standing fantasy of killing a high-ranking clergy member brought to life. Once Stephen gained entry into the Reverend's home, he wasted no time in aggressively advancing on the Reverend and stabbing him multiple times. Upon nearing the end of his life from his fatal injuries, it was reported that the Reverend said to Stephen that he was, quote, going to die. To which Stephen replied to the Reverend, quote, eff and die then, hurry up and die, end quote. Once the Reverend had died from his horrific injuries, Stephen posed his body. Stephen placed a picture of Jesus and a mirror on the floor next to the clergyman's body, and he placed a Bible open to the letter of Jude upon the reverend's chest. But that wasn't all that Stephen did. He placed other items around the clergyman's body. He placed gay pornography items, streamers, condoms, all scattered around the reverend's body in an effort to humiliate him, 
to humiliate his position within the church. That would have to do, Stephen must have thought. He had probably been disappointed that he would not be able to carry out his real fantasy of actually crucifying the clergyman physically, hanging him on a cross for his imaginary sins. So after doing all this, uh, being welcomed into the reverend's home, brutally murdering him, telling him to hurry up and die, placing objects both of religious meaning and not so religious meaning around his body, oh, Stephen Farrow was not done yet. After all that, he decided to crack open a cold beer in the reverend's home and watch an Indiana Jones movie. And after he had drank some beer and watched a movie, well, he had to steal something, of course, so he stole the reverend's watch and cell phone before he left. And it was early in the morning of February 15th, 2012, the very next day, that Stephen Farrow finally left the murder scene, and he used the dead man's cell phone to send a text. The text message reading, R.I.P. Mr. Sutter's, period. Pervert, period. The investigation didn't take long after that, thankfully. On February 18th, 2012, Stephen Farrow was identified as a suspect in this horrible murder. And knowing that, they issued a stern warning to the public not to approach Stephen if they saw him. And the next day, on February 19th, 2012, Stephen Farrow was finally, finally apprehended after a tip was called in. The tip came from a woman that he had been staying with. Thank goodness. So before he could commit any other horrible acts, Stephen was finally apprehended and promptly charged with the murders of both Reverend John Sutterds and Betty Yates. And he was also charged with that burglary he had committed at the beginning of the year. And on June 29th, 2012, Stephen Farrow pled not guilty to the murders. Why do they always plead not guilty? But he did plead guilty to the burglary charge. So the trial machinations went on and October 4th, 2012, the trial began. And finally, Stephen saw that maybe he should cop to the crime to get a lighter sentence, which he did. Stephen Farrow finally admitted to the murder of the Reverend on the grounds of a lighter charge of manslaughter as opposed to homicide. And when the jury came back from their deliberations, they were unanimous in finding Stephen Farrow guilty of killing Reverend John Suttard. But in the case of Betty Yates, the jury came back with an 11 to 1 majority, which found Stephen guilty of that murder. As for issuing the verdict and the sentencing, the judge outright called Stephen Farrow sadistic and sentenced him to spend the rest of his life in prison. With the trial finally over and Stephen Farrow tucked away again in prison, hopefully for good this time, the family members of the victims issued a statement. They were questioning how the deaths of their loved ones had been allowed to occur. They voiced questions about how things might have been different and what might have been done to prevent these tragedies. The family members of the victims went on to call for better mental health services and for precautions to be put in place. Quote, to ensure psychopaths with a known history of violence are not left roaming around at large, ready to attack someone. They said, quote, do we as a society need to think again about how we might better monitor and treat those in the community? And personally, I applaud them for this statement. And to answer their question of whether we have to do better as a society, as long as victims are created as a result of the failings of the criminal justice system and the mental health system, the answer will always be yes. Rest in peace to Betty Yates and Reverend John. May their memories be a blessing to all those who loved and cared for them. Thank you for your time in watching this video. 
I know your time is valuable and I so appreciate it that you spent some of it watching this video with me. And if you made it all the way to the end of this video, you know I appreciate you even more. Thank you so much. Let me know what you thought about this case in the comments below. Or even if you just want to say hi, say hi. Until next time, everyone, and until my next true crime case, please take care out there. It's rough, and I'll be thinking of you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.